Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Rethinking Resilience Insights from the Giving Ecosystem. Uh, we are joined today by Woodrow Rosenbaum from Giving Tuesday, and I am super excited that he's here to share a little bit of insight with us uh, into the giving ecosystem because it has been up and down uh, since the last three years, I would say, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I am excited to have him here. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be receiving all the um, all the slide deck as well as a recording so you can watch it again later. If you have any questions for Woodrow during the presentation, um, feel free to use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen and then uh, he'll get to as many questions as he has time for um, at the end of the session. And yeah, I think um, that's everything for now. We're going to get started in a few minutes, maybe like five minutes or so, um, just giving people a chance to pop in. So while we're waiting, I would love to have you all just um, open up the chat, um, tell us your name, where you're from, um, and maybe one word to describe the giving ecosystem. <laughs> How would you describe our giving ecosystem? Um, should be interesting. All right. I remember one time I heard like what the state of fundraising is these days. And I think a nonprofit was just like rough. That's how to describe it right now, rough. <laughs> so I don't know, hopefully Woodrow will have something more um, well, we'll try to we'll try to assuage that a little bit but it, yes this is what i hear too just a lot of folks are finding uh finding things um challenging out there right now oh and somebody says the chat is disabled hmm interesting well i can check on that um but if you are able to use the q a we do see your q a uh, messages so you can go ahead and um uh, feel free to continue to use the Q&A moving forward for now if you're not able to use the chat. Um, let me see. Um, we can try that now. I don't know if I changed the settings there for everyone. Um, panelists can chat with everyone. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, we'll we'll get started in a few minutes. And um, I just want to do a brief introduction. Uh, of, about Causebox in case you're um, new to Causebox. Um, as I had mentioned, we were joined today by Woodrow Rosenbaum, um, who is the Chief Data Officer for Giving Tuesday. Um, so he's been very instrumental in shaping the global generosity movement, uh, and he leads Giving Tuesday Data Commons. Uh, so I know that's a pretty popular place to go looking for things and data and all the information. So I'm so excited to have him here today with us. Um, but again, just before we dive into his session, um, a little bit about Causevox. Uh, Causevox modernizes your fundraising. So basically, we give you today's best-in-class donation pages um, equipped with mobile wallets, and you can run campaign sites with ticketing and peer-to-peer. -peer. So it's pretty much an uh, an all-in-one um, fundraising platform. We also offer hands-on support and onboarding with real people like me. And uh, we do offer guides and templates and webinars like today's webinar to help you just get up and running um, for success. Uh, so again, we offer branded donation pages. So we see that um, the majority of donors do prefer to donate on one that is branded. Um, it increases the donor's trust in your uh, in your organization. Uh, and uh, we also provide the their donation preferences um, in terms of automated recurring and pledge donations and um, enhanced mobile wallets. Uh, so you can pretty much run all of your fundraising, whether it's donations, ticketed events, um, ticketed events with peer-to-peer, -peer, it's all integrated. Um, so it makes it really easy. No coding is required to set up your website or donation page. Uh, so if you're interested in sort of, um, you know, converting more donors this Giving Tuesday or this holiday season for year end, we would encourage you to just book a quick demo with us. We have a 13-minute pre-recorded demo 
And also you can use this page to schedule a live demo with me and we can chat more about how, how um, Clausevox can help with your holiday fundraising this year. And I'll, ch I'll share that link um, in the chat uh, later. Um, but for now, I want to stop talking uh, and uh, pass this over to Woodrow. Um, and again, for those of you who just joined, um, this webinar is being recorded. The slides and the webinar on demand will be available after the webinar in a couple of days. All right. So here to kick it off is Woodrow Rosenbaum. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Jenna says that she's a real person, but that's exactly what a deep fake Jenna would say. So I don't know. That seems suspicious to me. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we're observing in the giving landscape and uh, fundraising ecosystem lately uh, at the Data Commons. And um, I, I, I would encourage you to use the Q&A function because I want to make sure that what we're sharing really is actionable for you and that we've covered stuff that is on your mind at the moment. Uh, if you have questions about what any of this actually means or how do you use this, uh, or even what does that word mean? Please let me know because I'm happy to to go over anything in more detail or or uh, or cover anything that um, try to cover anything that I, I haven't put in this presentation um, distinctly. Um, as Jenna said, I'm the chief data officer for Giving Tuesday, which does in fact mean that part of the job is measuring Giving Tuesday activity around the world. That's that's part of what we do, and it's how this data and insights work was launched. But beyond that, uh, the Data Commons mission really is to uncover all of the facets of generosity, how people leverage their giving to make change in their communities through nonprofits and in other ways, certainly on Giving Tuesday, but also the rest of the year. And we do that very collaboratively. So we have hundreds of organizations in our U.S. working groups. Um, our global hub teams uh, engage 50 other countries in building capacity and conducting research. We have a data science team and a data engineering team um, who conduct this our novel research as well as build infrastructure and tools for the social sector to leverage for greater understanding um, and, and to enable the work of other researchers and to connect increasingly research to practice. So that research that is being conducted is informed by the needs of practitioners on the ground. And then it's disseminated and translated for a practitioner audience so that we can make sense of these data and, and make data-driven decisions. And we do that very largely through through this vast peer learning network that is Giving Tuesday. So it's the organizations that run campaigns on the day and that get involved in our community campaigns and our learning. Um, it's also the nearly 100 country leader teams, none of whom work for Giving Tuesday, the organization, but each of whom have their own organizations and missions and use Giving Tuesday as a mechanism for achieving those missions and also as co-creators and learners within this network. And our job is to understand what we're discovering there and to de derive best practice from that uh, and amplify it. And so I'm going to talk about what we're observing within this generosity ecosystem uh, lately and what we think that means for organizations right now, nonprofits in particular, how this impacts fundraising results. Um, and our approach here is to not only look at the monetary aspects of people's giving and also not only the nonprofit sector, but really to try to get a complete holistic view of that ecosystem. And we have a number of different tools that we use for this um, from the direct donation transactions that we collect um, about every day of the year um, to surveys that we put in the field to, to get an understanding of what people care about and what they're responding to and, and how they're leveraging their giving. And this helps to give us a much broader sense of kind of what the drivers of the behavior is, as well as the ways in which people are getting uh, impact in their communities, what they care about, why they care about it, what they do about it, and what the outcomes of that are. 
Um, and so even if your interest is very focused on fundraising results for an organization, it, we really feel like it's very critical to have a much broader understanding of that ecosystem if we're going to be effective. And part of this is just really good news. Like the vast majority of people around the world are giving. And what we have found is that this is pretty robust. The, the, the giving environment has been quite uh, robust and diverse. Um, so not only do we see that the majority of people are giving, most people um, are also giving not are giving both to directly to individuals, to nonprofit organizations, and also to other structured entities that aren't necessarily incorporated, but like mutual aid networks is a good example. And that 57% of people are doing all three of those things. So this is good news. We've also seen that it's pretty resilient uh, over the last couple of years, at least. We've seen that, that these giving levels um, are retained quite strongly. And there are some differences. We see uh, differences by demographic. We see diff differences from country to country, both in how people give and their level of generosity. Um, Interestingly, when we look at that by age, we find that younger people tend to be the most generous. Um, now, the way that they're leveraging their generosity definitely varies from place to place. It has a lot to do with um, the economic situation of the giver, and that's that's quite true everywhere we look. Um, but it's interesting to see that across the board, young people are particularly generous. And as I said, we're, our interest in this is not just nonprofit giving. And part of the reason for that is um, a lot of giving doesn't involve a nonprofit. So what we find is that uh, around the world and in every place, um, most people are doing more than one of these things. In fact, the majority, a slight majority are doing all three. So although we will see some variation from country to country and from and depending on what is being given. So in some places, money tends to flow towards nonprofits a little bit more. In some places, the giving tends to be more, more directed toward individuals compared to um, these other mechanisms. Critically, most people are doing more than one of these things. And, and, and we don't find them to be competitive or cannibalistic of each other. So this is really important to recognize when we think about engaging donors for our organizations to recognize that their donation behavior, their giving behavior is quite diverse and understanding what the drivers of that are and that that's a feature, not a bug, is going to be really important when we think about how we're going to do this job of getting that, uh, getting that engagement. Because on the one hand, we see there are some groups, older people in particular, who have a kind of greater level of trust and affinity or value the charities and nonprofits more than others. We also see that not everybody is being engaged equally by those organizations. And that of uh, the best indicator that somebody is going to give in one of these ways is that they've given in another one of these ways. So what this tells us is that there is a missed opportunity to engage um, more more people, more diverse groups, um, for, and that, and in fact, what we see on Giving Tuesday is a really interesting example. Giving Tuesday doesn't, in some ways, looks a lot different from the rest of the year. And one of the ways that it looks different is it engages more of the population than we're seeing engaged by organizations on on a day to day basis. And that missed opportunity, I'll get into the economics of that, has has created some significant issues for nonprofit sector resilience. So we looked at kind of where people are directing their money, the mechanisms and the recipients. We also look at what people are giving. So we're interested in their giving their, their things, money and time, but also their advocacy. And again, just like the, the channels or the mechanisms, the recipients, we see that most people are giving more than one way. They're giving more than one type of thing. Um, and in fact, giving money is not the most common behavior in anywhere we looked. Um, giving things tends to be more um, a more common mechanism in the U.S., that's true. 
But again, more important than that, it's very rare that somebody's only doing one of these things. It's exceedingly rare that somebody's only giving money to nonprofits. In fact, close to zero. Effectively, nobody does that. So what does that tell us about how we can engage and how we must engage? Well, one of the things it tells us is that givers want a more diverse way of, of showing their support. And as organizations, an important thing to learn from this is we need multiple ways that people can get into our mission and be part of the solutions and the uh, and the the charitable outcomes that we're that we're looking for. So we know that these again these behaviors are not cannibalistic. This is not a zero sum or a scarcity situation. The best indicator somebody's going to do one of these things is that they've done another one of these things. And in fact, volunteering seems to be. Um, more of a gateway toward money than the other way around. But again, it what's really important is people want more ways that to to give. They will they will try to show up in multiple ways. This includes advocacy and advocating for a cause is really important. And I think particularly important for, from the sort of younger adult and below uh, categories because these are people who kind of have an innate understanding that they're that their voice has value. And one of the ways they can give back to your organization is by helping to talk about the good that you do. And so, and people tend to, we've seen from the data that people tend to put their money where their mouth is. So offering more opportunities to engage with your organization and be part of your mission, including being advocates is really important and can help to diversify your message and make you more interesting. So you're not always just soliciting money, but you're also giving people lots of other ways to get involved. And your donors actually want to hear from you more. That's pretty clear overall, uh, particularly younger donors want to hear from you more. Um, and so your opportunity there is to talk about more different things. So you're not always a one track uh, communications. Um Again, what we see is people giving in different ways, and it and and it does it does change depending on where we look. But everywhere we look, we see this this diversity. So it's not unique to the U.S. that we see this. We see it right across the board. The, it really comes down to degrees, and and most importantly, the fact that uh, none of these. Uh, none of these ways of giving, um, none of them sort of outweigh substantially any of the others. It's a slight skew depending on what demographic or what place we're talking about, but not, not substantial. The message here, people are giving in more than one way, and that's their preferred way of giving. One of the ways we're getting a view of this is through Giving Pulse. So Giving Pulse is a, a new instrument that we launched a little over a year ago. We've been using these data in our other products, but Giving Pulse will have its own reports and dashboards that are going to start getting released uh, this year. Um, and it's really interesting because what it allows us to do, this is in the U.S. so far only, although we're going to be rolling it out to other places around the world. We're asking people every week, about their previous week's giving behavior. And we get a really a rich um, um, uh, data set about what these trends are. What crises are people aware of in, in, in the world? How are they responding? Have they been solicited? We can see the demographics. We can see this regionally. We can see it by cause area. We've got an enormous amount of data about what is driving behavior and how these behaviors intersect and interact to help us really uncover what are the important trends what are the categories of giver and what do we do about that? Like what is working to get them activated? So overall, what we're seeing is generosity is alive and well. This is great. It's all good news. Let's talk about the money to nonprofits because the story there is notably different. So the fundraising effectiveness project is our key mechanism for measuring nonprofit donations. And uh, this is something that we, that we, uh, the reporting that we do out of our data science and engineering team. And we produce these reports in partnership with the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And when we look at this data, I think that this particular chart is, is quite um, illustrative of the trend that we're seeing. So um, I'm going to try to draw on the screen. I wonder how that's going to work. No, it's not going to work. I lied. I'm not going to do that. Um, what's, 
important to note here is the that the this overall trend is for more money from fewer donors. And th- I, I know that's not going to be surprising to anybody. Um, but when we look at it this way, we've normalized these data for 2012. And what you can see is in the dark line, the, these dark bars, a steady increase in the, the value of donations, not taking um, inflation into account, but a steady increase. And a pretty steady and then more marked de- decrease in the number of donors. So first of all, there's a number of things to note about that. That's bad. Like we should not be okay with that. And the main reason for that is that we know that organizations with a broad base of support are much more resilient. So this including like smaller donors, those organizations that have that grassroots support are more resilient through economic downturn and uncertainty. And it's the large donors who are more responsive to those economic shifts. And so one of the things you'll note here is that as we saw this decline in donors, Uh, Once we hit the end of last year, 2022, um, that uncertainty in the economic situation did, in fact, get us that negative result. The bigger donors started giving less, and we saw a drop-off for the first time in many years in the value of donations. That drop-off has continued into this year, and it's at that high end. Another thing to note here is that the one year where we see a reversal of that consolidation trend was 2020. So 2020, we saw more donors than the previous year for the first time in a long time. And we know some of what was driving that was COVID-related response, but it didn't really look like disaster response. So um, for one thing, it wasn't just COVID-related causes that were getting that lift. And that lift came despite the fact that organizations had had their entire model of fundraising severely disrupted. We saw giving moments driving that acquisition. And so, yes, that included COVID-related causes and sort of secondary impacts of COVID, but it was also things like in August, we saw a big spike in uh, in racial justice causes dr- getting new donors in. And those giving moments really were key to driving that acquisition. And not only that, those donors in 2020, the new donors, r- were retained into the following year at higher levels than we'd ever seen before across all cause areas. Nevertheless, a return to, quote, normal did seem to mean for a lot of organizations a return to a hyper, like a really uh, hyper focus on large donor stewardship. And so what we saw, the impact of that was retention went down, acquisition went down, over-focused on, over-indexed on large donors. And the result was we ended up by the end of 2021, right back to where we were in 2019 on number of donors. And then 2022 and the fourth quarter of that year, those big donors that we've been relying on year after year after year to come in during our annual campaigns, they didn't show up in the way that they had been over the years. And the result of that was dollars down and a precipitous drop in in the uh in the number of donors. And so where we end 2022 is with a with this big drop off of 10% in the number of donors and dollars dollars down as well. Uh retention really poor. And I understand that some of what is driving this this focus on large donor stewardship is like really short term immediate need by organizations growing. But the problem there is that we undermine the foundation, that grassroots giving foundation. And so we are setting ourselves up for a lack of resilience. And there are things in our organizations we can do to avoid that result. We've seen this donor decline across all donor groups, um, but it's the downsizing of those major donors that we've become to over rely on that is causing this economic uncertainty. We have too many eggs in too few baskets. We must is not optional anymore. If we're going to be resilient, we must add more baskets because I want to make something clear. Like a lot of times I, I talk to folks in the sector and I think they kind of think I'm giving them the weather report. Like these are the economic realities 
Sure, there are economic realities, but you have agency to change this. These results are not inevitable. Now, there is one mitigating factor that I think is important to note, uh, besides just this need to diversify and do more engagement of grassroots givers, and that is the, the vast rise in the value of uh, donor-advised funds. We, su we see that the macroeconomics show in, during the 2008-2009 the recession that donor-advised funds mitigated the worst impacts of the recession on nonprofits. There's more money in those DAFs than ever before. And so in that respect, represent a really strong opportunity um, to, to, to bolster that high-end giving. Um, that said, and, and I, I want to be clear too, I'm not suggesting you need to do less large donor stewardship. I'm saying we can no longer afford to do only that. And one of the things we know that works is Giving Tuesday. We see um, a Giving Tuesday is this moment of very broad, very diverse grassroots giving engagement beyond just the dollars, and it adds up. We saw record donations on Giving Tuesday last year, and we saw more people than ever participating in the movement. And as we have seen more broadly, most people do more than one thing on Giving Tuesday. So for the day itself, and and I want to note, we don't think this is just about what you do on Giving Tuesday. This is important to understand, but I don't think Giving Tuesday is actually that different in terms of what the opportunities are for engaging more often, more broadly. Um, but it's interesting since we started measuring this for years, we've seen this. In the U.S., the most common behavior on Giving Tuesday is donating money. But the least common behavior is only donating money. The vast majority of people are doing more than one thing. Most people, the typical thing is you do more than one thing. And, and nearly all the donors are also taking some other action, which is why these numbers don't add up to 37 million, because people are doing more than one thing. This is a great opportunity, and it also points to how we can think about engaging people differently and more often with more points of entry into our mission. When we think about acquisition at that grassroots level in particular, that's where acquisition is, uh, where the biggest acquisition opportunities are. It was really interesting to look at 2020 because even though, as I said, there were lots of things that drove that donor acquisition in 2020, Giving Tuesday was still the biggest single driver of new donors across the nonprofit sector. So what we're seeing here is, is for a particular cause areas is uh, animals and environment. We chose it because it's, uh, it's, it's canonical. Um, if you plot all cause areas, you see exactly the same spikes. There's just a little more noise throughout the year, but the peaks are exactly the same. And we saw that across all causes, Giving Tuesday is driving more acquisition than anything else, even in an overall up year, even with lots of other giving moments driving acquisition. So this tells us about an opportunity in the moment. It also really is a story of what happens when we engage more broadly, when we tap into the current zeitgeist and what that means for giving uh, our, our supporters a feeling of belonging. Most Giving Tuesday donors said they gave because they wanted to be part of a bigger group of people doing good. And I think that combined with the fact that small organizations uh, do uh, over perform on Giving Tuesday compared to larger organizations tells us about what these opportunities are. To help people act on things that are very close to them, often literally in their communities, but also feel like they're part of a collective action and getting more impact. And you can do that on Giving Tuesday. You can do that other times of the year as well. So we look at this, we sit, our, our view on this is giving is not in decline. We're not in a scarcity environment, but we have to diversify our practices if we're going to reverse some of these negative trends. If we're going to tap into that prolific, diverse, and robust generosity, we're going to have to find other ways of engaging. We can no longer afford to do this, th this repetitive process of donor stewardship from the 1950s, where we say collectively, well, this isn't working very well, so I guess we'll have to do twice as much of it. 
We need to diversify. We need more ways of engagement. We do think that there's an abundance. And uh, one thing that I, I will note here is I think a lot of organizations saw that very strongly in 2020. Organizations feeling, oh, it's a bad time for me to ask people because they're worried about all the things they're worried about. People give during tough times. And so if you think about your engagement with donors as giving them an opportunity to have agency rather than a, an unwelcome solicitation, if you engage people from the perspective that they are already generous and that you are helping them fulfill a human need to, to, for belonging and impact, you're going to do a lot better than if you consider your message to be an unwelcome, burdensome solicitation. So let's talk about a couple of sort of what do we do strategically and tactically about some of this? Well, first of all, this collective giving, this halo effect really matters. It helps us increase giving. Embracing advocacy uh, from our supporters is one of the ways to do that, recognizing that we can you know, leverage these giving moments like Giving Tuesday and talk about them earlier and more often. Um, recurring, I think there's a huge opportunity for this. Um, what we see is that Giving Tuesday donors have a higher lifetime value and a big part of what's driving that is a, a greater level of new recurring givers happening on Giving Tuesday. It again, demonstrates an opportunity. Partly it's a product market fit. I think all of that skews a little bit younger for a variety of reasons. And so does Giving Tuesday. Um, but I don't think that's only Giving Tuesday advice. I think we can be leveraging recurring a lot more than we are. And now, obviously, your, your organization's specific circumstances may vary. You might need to be driving more donors for whatever reason, as opposed to more value. But generally speaking, recognizing, you know, when we look at Giving Tuesday, we see the the non-Giving Tuesday acquired donor is maybe worth $900 and a Giving Tuesday donor is worth closer to $1,200. And that 25% increase is, is at least partly due to the fact that um, that recurring is such a strong part of that moment. Your website matters a lot. I think this is one thing that we gets a little bit lost sometimes. Um we see that people are as likely to give on on web as they are other ways. Uh, they tend to give less money there, but partly that's because we ask them for less money that way. Um, but your website and like not even mobile, but just your website still matters. And so making sure that you know you've got that dialed in, that it's not adding friction to that your messaging is strong, that it delivers uh, you know a, an urgency to act and a clear call to action. Like these are really important components of just making sure you're successful um, and thinking about engaging, not even engaging your supporters in more ways, but giving your supporters more opportunities to be part of your mission. So thinking about what the, and that doesn't mean a list. It doesn't mean all the things all the time. What it means is give you more touch points, more opportunities to engage and to think about not just, okay, well, I asked them for money last month, so I won't, I'll wait three months and then I'll ask them for more money. Talk to them more, give them more ways that they can be involved. Um, and then remembering that none of this stuff is, um, is cannibalistic. So what we see is that Again, the best indicator somebody's going to do one of these things is that they did another. And so I, I one of the things that we tend to think about here is to think about your your act your engagements um not from the perspective of that opportunity that you're offering. So what I mean by that is it's hard sometimes when times are tough and there's headwinds to to not sort of think of the, in terms of a scarcity environment but whether or not you are on the same page with me and believe though no, this is we're actually in an abundant situation i would ask you to just think about for this coming giving tuesday and giving season what if we were in an abundant environment what would that what would i do differently if i really believed that there was abundance available would I partner with other organizations? Would I work with community groups? Would I invite people to do things that weren't donations to my organization? Like, how would I, how would my strategies be different if I thought that there was an abundance? 
Um, I will pause here for questions. I do want to say thank you. Like the Giving Tuesday Data Commons is building a fundamental infrastructure for the nonprofit sector to create the kind of data environment that every other industry has to be able to plot a course for success. And we couldn't do that without the financial supporters that we have. If you're interested in getting involved, you can just email us at data at givingtuesday.org or you can go to givingtuesday.org slash data for more information about all of our projects. Jenna, I will pause there and we'll see if we have any questions. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Woodrow, for that um, wonderful presentation and, and empowering information, really, because it's really not all that bad out there, I guess, right? There's <laughs> apparently there's an abundance of giving opportunity. There uh, really is. And I, I don't want to like, I don't want to, um, I don't want to be flippant about the situation that fundraisers and organizations find themselves in right now. I've seen the data about how burned out folks are. And what I hope people can come away with is that this is in fact empowering. We have opportunity. We can do more and we don't have to go alone. Um, if we're feeling less like competitors, if we feel like we have something to celebrate with our community and our supporters, my hope is what that means is uh, we get, um, it, it. it is in fact uh, a lightening the load. Um, yeah, what is, you know, let's, let's be clear, not, not an easy time for nonprofits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. Michelle just wrote in spot on exactly it confirms the direction she's trying to lead her organization. Yeah. I think yeah, this has been that's... very insightful. I, I did. I think this is the, the link that you mentioned, right? Woodrow. That sounds right. I, um, Yep, there. that's it. So, yeah, no, I, I, you know, as Michelle, that's really encouraging to hear. I think, you know, some of the things, some of the things are not directly within our control. I think we we don't have the the right incentives and funding environment with with the with institutional funders to kind of uh, to change the our to create a different enabling environment. I think we should be deseasonalizing giving in the U.S., but I recognize organizations don't have a lot of risk capital to invest and in, in extra capacity, right? So there are challenges in this that that we don't have as much control over, but we don't have to keep, um, you know, promoting the best fundraiser to major gift officer every single time, right? We do, we don't have to silo development and marketing as if it's not all just storytelling. So there are things we can do within our organizations to set ourselves up for success better that actually make it easier, not harder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, so it sort of sounds like you're saying like, um, yeah, again, like di diversify the strategy, try something new. I, th I think like also in, on the cause box side, we've noticed that, um, we have to nonprofits need to be, you know, very, very clear in their messaging, very specific um, and really cater to really a very compelling story and their brand. And um, I guess I'm just curious what you think, Woodrow, about like how, how what is what is like one tip for these um, nonprofits as they prepare their Giving Tuesday materials? Like how do they go about writing something that's compelling for a diverse audience? Yeah, I've got, I think it's three thoughts on that. First, it's interesting to say, try something new, because I think we need more experimentation in the nonprofit sector. Like we should be A-B testing messages all the time. And, but it's hard to do that because there isn't a lot of capacity and there's no room for error, right? We, we don't, our, our organizations, our board, the governance, our funders, they don't, they're, they're not incentivizing that, even though we know that it's really critical. One of the interesting things that we've seen on, on Giving Tuesday is that 82% of organizations say they use the day as a time to experiment with something new. And I think part of it was just like we kind of gave everybody permission to, to go off script for a day. And that's great. Like you should use it for that. And I hope that that we see more of that year, year round. Then specifically when you think about giving Tuesday messaging and what the opportunity is, I think two general comments, although it's definitely, you know, comes down a lot to what you are trying to accomplish. But the two things I would say is one, 
Giving Tuesday is an amplifier. That's really clear. People are out there. They're looking for ways to give. They're more likely to give. The conversion rates go up. Small organizations are overperforming because of that environment. Um, you know, I think or, small organizations tend to worry about the quote noise on Giving Tuesday because the big orgs are like buying tens of thousands of dollars a week in YouTube ads. That mm -hmm. works for you. Because that raises the volume and it's not, and it's the small orgs that are actually benefiting the most from that, from that uh, added um, um, discourse about, about giving. What we don't think is a good message is give to me because it's Giving Tuesday. Giving right. Tuesday helps you get uh, urgency because if people want to be in on the fun, they got to give during the campaign, which doesn't necessarily mean on the day you can talk earlier. And you can talk later and still leverage the moment. But the key thing there being your promise to your community of givers is about the impact that you're having and the and the impact that they can have. Giving Tuesday gives you the benefit of that added urgency to act as well as a celebratory environment. Right. You don't have to wait for some kind of crisis that's in your cause area to get engaging because you, because we have a day for it, which is great. It just makes that easier. And the last thing I'll say is that you just do what's within your capacity to do. Think about it less as its own campaign and more as part of you know a tent pole and a series of communications you're going to have with givers including through the rest of December. Giving Tuesday donors are more likely to give again before the end of the year than other givers. So think about it in terms of a, a, a storytelling arc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great point to continue the conversation after their donation on Giving Tuesday. Um, I know we we have a couple of questions. I'm going to start with the um, the chat. Uh, Martha says, the reason we often turn to older major gifts and less to younger is because we need to use our time wisely. Does this mean you recommend investing in more donor relations to include younger group? I think that's something you spoke to a lot of if you want. Yeah, to I mean, we have to like think about what the opportunity like. It's tough because obviously we have to make generalizations as soon as we're talking about whole demographic groups, but but they're somewhat useful in insofar as they are they're they're predictive. Younger givers are less likely to be able to give more money. And there's been this, this focus on, well, I got to go where the money is. The problem is that where the money is has shifted, right? So what, now that we've got more economic uncertainty, those grassroots givers aren't changing their behavior, but the, but the big givers are. So we just can't afford to only rely on one group. Also, that's obviously short-sighted. We should be engaging younger people because they're going to be long. They have more years to be our supporters. So when we think about engaging younger donors, or if you want to look at it differently, donors who are motivated to be givers, who are less brand sensitive, are more interested in, uh, less likely to show distinctions between different forms of giving, but also much more likely to kind of have a diverse portfolio of ways and things that they give. I think recurring is a really key way to do that. I think there's reasons why recurring skews younger. These are people who are, who are show very strong giving sentiment are giving more. They, they are more generous than older generations. They have less money to give. So lower the price point. Also, we're talking often about people who had just are accustomed to subscription models. The key thing there, though, is also like we can't continue to put everybody into the same donor stewardship box once we bring them in. So you think about I've, I've created a campaign to bring in donor recurring donors. How did they come in? What was the channel? What did what did they respond to? What is their interest? Why is it that you want you need to talk to them more often? The nice thing about recurring is it just helps you reset that whole engagement to think more about this person subscribed to feeling good 12 times a year. My job is to deliver on that. How do I make them understand that they're part of my mission on an ongoing basis? That's the way to think about that. That's how we can build that base. And by fo and a focus on recurring can help get that done because the value of those donors who come in are, is so much higher. You're, obviously, your conversion rate is going to go down if you focus on recurring first. 
but the value of those donors is so much higher um, that it can really make the difference. And that's how, and it's also very efficient for your organization. Right. Just to have that consistent giving, um, I can definitely understand how that would be so valuable. And uh, just a reminder to make it easy for them to make those recurring gifts. Um, but yeah, and moving, moving, just want to move on to David's question in the Q&A. And if anybody else has any last minute questions, please feel free to chat those in or put them in the Q&A. Um, David uh, said, do you have data on donations to third world needs giving versus domestic needs giving? And is there a trend away from third world giving? It's an interesting question. Uh, so the answers to those two questions are yes and not sure. So um, part of, so we we do have good data on, on how U.S. donors are directing their um, their funds as well as their other forms of giving, but money is more fungible and it's easier to see that sort of that change. Um, so we do have data on whether they're giving locally, nationally, or internationally. Um, we also can look at the cause area and we can correlate, we can cross-reference those cause areas by, by uh, the geography. We don't have good long-term baseline there. So I think that we we need more data before we're able to answer the second question um, because part of what we see is volatility, um, very heavily driven by world circumstances. Um, so I don't think we have sufficient data that I can, will say definitively at this point that yes, that is the overall trend. And it may be that the trend is there is no trend. We'll see. Hmm. Good to know. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Woodrow, for all of your wealth of knowledge here today. I'm I'm so glad that we were able to schedule this just in time to, to prepare because I think having these data insights and just new ways of thinking can be very beneficial. I'm gonna I'm trying to remember that phrase that you said uh about um the donor mindset, um, you know, making sure they have, or, oh, the, it's a very human need to belong and um, be a part of an impact, something to that effect. Our, that our Romanian leader said that uh, at, uh, when I was there last, and I, it really stuck with me, that people have a fundamental human need to give. And if we think of ourselves as providing an opportunity for people to exercise that need and to have agency, our communications are going to be different. Like the meaner way I sometimes say that is if you think that your message is going to be an unwelcome, burdensome solicitation, you might be right. But the answer isn't talk less. The answer is talk better. Ah, nice. Well, on those wise words, <laughs> I will, uh, uh, give us a chance to get back to the rest of our day. And just thank you again so much, Woodrow, for this incredible time together. Um, before everybody leaves, I do just want to send the demo link that I said I was going to paste in the chat, just in case you need a donation form for your upcoming donations. And um, with that, uh, I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Woodrow. This has been awesome. Thanks, Jenna. Have a all good right. day. Take Bye, care. everybody. Bye.